Hey everybody, it's me again and it's been a while, okay? I'm creating a new series of videos that kind of different than the previous one. These hopefully are not too technical and hopefully are, they are geared to our, uh, for the people that they're not studying computer science or programming, but they have a need to learn programming in their uh, field some form of programming, not too deep. And the idea came from my daughters, my wife, and then they, uh, so I decided to create these videos for them and hopefully share it with everybody else that like to learn about programming. And uh, I wanna try to use a method where it is simplified and focuses on the concept of programming rather than the language that we use and the complexity of a particular language. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, usually we have, whether you're a researcher or you work in a bank or you work in a marketing company or you're doing a polling or research analysis, you, need, you have a need, or we call that sometimes in, in our term is, is a, a problem that you want to solve. Okay, and that problem usually have, we come up, for that problem usually we come up with a solution. If, and let's hope that we have a solution. If it's a, we don't have a solution, it's a bigger problem. So now, with the solution, in computer terms, we call that an algorithm. So you hear the term algorithm, algorithm a lot, and there's different complexities of this algorithm. And what is an algorithm? An algorithm is nothing but a series of steps to solve a particular problem. Once you come up with this algorithm and you know how to solve it, usually you can write programs easily to solve that problem. And that, why, that's what we call, we use computer language to solve a program, uh, to solve the problem, we call it a program. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this and then look at more details. So as I said, you have a problem, and the problem is stem from requirements. If you're, a, if you're in a bank, somebody comes working in a bank, somebody comes to you and say, look, I want to study the effect of people taking loans in this particular area. All right, so that is a problem and then you need to solve it. So you go about and search for a solution to this problem and you come up with an algorithm. And the requirements are industry specific. So if you're in a bank, your requirements come from the banking industry. If you are doing a research, then it comes from the research of the topic that you are working on. Uh, if, you're, if you're working in uh, like polling and analysis, data analysis, then it comes from statistics and things like that, yeah? So that is the requirements and people spend a lot of time on this part. The algorithm, after we, come, after we come up with a solution, we call it the algorithm, then how can I express my, my solution or that algorithm? I can express it in just plain language, whatever language you wanna use. It could be something else, we call it pseudocode, which is basically a shorter form of a natural language, okay? And kind of like shortcuts, if you will. Then you have the other one that is very popular. Popular, we use what we call flowchart. And then, once we come up with the solution, and that is probably 60 to 50%, 50 to 60% of the writing the program. Because if you come up with the solution, all you have to do is translate that solution to a, to a, into a computer language program, which is, you just follow the steps that you came up with, all right? So that is a huge, it's not easy, all right? Six, I even I would say even six, you know, even to 70, up to 70%, okay? The next thing is that we come up with the computer program. Now, the computer program has challenges by itself. And that's where people get scared and, and shy away from it. First, it's nothing but a set of instruction using computer language. The issue is computer language. Well, what are, the compu what are computer languages and what do I use? And that can, can, give, uh, can get very confusing. And the reason it gets confusing because luckily, and uh, 
don't know if we call it luckily, but we have lots of computers, lots of devices. Each device runs on, has what we call different operating system. And for example, many of the computers uses Windows operating system. Some use, uh, you know, Mac operating systems. Some uses Android, iOS, Linux, special software. You have web. All these can get confusing. And what do I use? Well, hopefully I'm going to shield you away from this and focus on the learning process. Okay. So the type of language you use or the computer language you use depends on the things that you use here. So I have... So I, I have Java, for example, it can run on a lot of these platforms. C Sharp runs on Windows. Objective-C runs on Mac and iOS. Swift runs on Mac and iOS. C runs on a lot of those programs, a lot of those platforms. All right, so again, we're, hopefully I'm going to get you away from all of this and focus on the problem solving and how to think like a programmer, okay? So typically a computer program has two types. One of them is called native and the other one is called interpreted. What are the difference? What are, what's the difference between the two, okay? The native programs use computer languages that are actually can be translated into a machine language. Things like C, C++, C Sharp, VB, Swift, Objective-C, etc. These are languages that, yes, they are specific to a certain environment, but they compile, we, each, we can change them into a computer language and they compile and run on a particular computer. So the process of compiling it it changes to a computer language, and we just simply take that program and run it on that particular machine or machine type. So if we create one using C Sharp that I'm creating for Windows operating system or web operating system, web environment, and then I can, I can uh, compile it and put it on all the machines that can run Windows, okay? The interpreted, uh, this is where probably we're gonna spend a lot of time is that, yes, it's a program, just like, you know, the user computer language program, just like Java, JavaScript, R, Python, MATLAB, etc. These are, yes, programs, but if you open them and open them in a computer that does not have what we call the program that interpreted it, it doesn't do anything. Okay, it's just like a text document, all right? So these type of programs, they need another program that interpret it. So it changes it to what? It changes it to uh, instructions to the computer, okay? So the interpret one, yes, you write the code, but you need another program that does it. So for example, if you want to do MATLAB, you need MathWorks. If you use Java, you need GRE. If you use JavaScript, you need something called like a browser. So things like that. Okay, which one is better? These usually are faster than these because they, they, they are native to the machine that you're working on, okay? All right, so if we look at the structure of the program, usually the program, and this is a blessing, a program usually consists of, I would call it three main things. You have a, an input, you have a process, you have output. Now, the input usually can, can, or we can gather input for a program to be to be used information for that input, for, uh, information that, or data that we want to use in our program usually comes from a keyboard, a sensor or sensors, data files, cameras, microphones, screens, database, and external data. I'm just going to focus on a couple of these. You know, for example, if you if you use sensors, uh, why would you use sensors? If you have a smart home and then you have something that is monitoring your driveway and we have on the driveway a chip recognizer that recognizes the owner of the house. So as they drive in that, in that driveway, the sensor recognizes that the owner of the house, sends a signal to the computer, and then the computer opens the driveway, all right? 
That's how you use sensor. You can have data files, and this is what a lot of researchers use. In the past, a lot of people use these data files. Now, people, a lot of people use databases, but data files can act like a database where you gather a lot of data, you store it in an Excel sheet or some sort of a comma delimited format, and you feed it into your program, it does something with it, and it produces some information. Touch screens, database, as I said, database is different than data files. Database is where you actually have, like what we call it, files and records, tables and rows. And these things have usually relations. So it's usually called relational database. Okay, where, why? Because, for example, if you have, uh, if you have a customer in a bank, a customer in a bank have bank account. If you have an order, you have an order and you have order details for it. And then you have, the customer that placed the order. So usually there's relationship with all this stuff. External data, for example, you want to get data from uh, the weather services to display it into your application. And based on that, you can do certain messages or certain um, uh, well, processing. So you look at the data, the external data from the, you know, the, maybe the weather authority. Or you want to look at the stock market that's an alert to the, the in your screen so you can get maybe some services from somewhere that give you information about the current stock prices that's how external data work now you have things like a process what goes in the process and that is the heart and meat of your program that's where your algorithm is implemented these are usually nothing but we call them variables you put values in them but these this is where you do your processing and this is where you have logic, you have instructions, you have actions, you have calculations. That's where the, the meat of the bulk of your work happens, okay? Which is typically you take your algorithm that you came up with and then implement it in this process, in this part here. And then the output, of course, and you have the, you can basically a lot of them are similar to the input. You can send it to a sensor, you can turn a particular light on, you can send it to a data, you can send it, store it into a data file, you can send the output to a speaker, you can send it to screens, you change the colors, whatever you wanna do, you can uh, send it to a database to store the information in the database after the processing. And again, you can send it to another services, a website, whatever, external data, you can send it to a printer, okay? Um, so that is this part, I would say, does not differ much at all from a lot of computer programs. Okay, so that's hopefully what we're gonna focus on. And in particular, this part here, the process. How to think like a programmer in order to help you solve your problem, to solve the uh, problems that you're having at work or your study to help you become more productive in your environment. Okay. The next part is we are going to talk about the, what am I going to use to for the remaining of these videos. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, we need to decide on what environment we're going to use to in order to teach you this stuff. Well, we can do. We have there are plenty of programming environments, and there is there are you know different complexity with these programming environments. And I don't want to scare you away. So I'm hopefully, hopefully I'm gonna find something for you that basically find a notepad, type, type, type something on it, in it, and try it out. To learn, again, the concepts of programming. And to think like a programmer. I'm going to show you some examples of different tools if you can try them out on your own. And I will do that in the next video. I hope you like this video. I hope you find it useful. Again, it's just an introduction or just an overview of what programming is all about. And don't, if you found it too much, don't be scared because we're not going to cover this again. It just, uh, I'm going to refer to it to some part of it, but this is just a big overview how we go about creating computer programs. And I will see you on the next video.